And well, thanks very much for coming out tonight. Really good to see you again. Um, it doesn't seem like however many months it was since I was last here, but um, it's uh, too long. But we've been um, out enjoying some uh, archaeology walks and talks and visits in uh, Stronzi. Um, but tonight we're talking um, about Lynx House Stronzi, about the, the Mesolithic site that we excavated back in 2008-9. And this is part of the... Um, North Isles Landscape Partnership Scheme um, and it's part of the Seas of the North Isles project which is, so tonight's funded by Wessex Archaeology um, and doing in conjunction with UHI Archaeology Institute and Orca, Orkney Research Centre for Archaeology that we are both um, part of. Um, so I'm Dan Lee um, and I work for Orca and the UHI and so I was involved in excavating the site. This is my colleague. Yeah, I'm Ben Elliott, so mostly before but not all. Um, so I'm a lecturer at UHI and I specialise in the European Mesolithic, so I'm relatively new to Orkney, I only moved up in August, um, so I know relatively little about the Orcadian Mesolithic, but I do know a fair bit more about the wider context in which this site sits, at both the kind of national and international level, so that's what I'll be speaking to mostly today. So, um, it was great, we went for a walk to the site earlier, some of you came on that, it was really nice to talk about the site in the landscape, we can, we can do that again sometime, there'll be plenty of other times to, to do that I think. Um, but what we wanted to do, to do tonight was talk you through that, the story of how the site was found. But take a little step back and give you a bit of background um, to the Mesolithic, what we mean by the Mesolithic. The Mesolithic in Scotland and in Orkney and Stronzi, to put the site in a bit of context. Tell the story of how we found Lynx House and how we excavated it, what we found, what the results are. We've also got some um, selected artefacts at the back there in, in wee bags you can have a look at. And there's a, replica, a reconstruction, um, uh, some mesolithic artefacts that are from a, a modern, um, a, a more recently produced um, uh, assemblage of blades and cores. Um, so you can have a look at those. You can pick those up, but the ones in the bags are the ones from the actual site, so we'll keep those in the bag, because as you'll see, they're really, really small. But we can talk you through those after the, after the talk. And then we're going to set that in a bit of the wider story and about how, you know, we've been talking to some of you about this, but about how Stronzi can um, and tell that Mesolithic story um, as well. So we'll talk about that towards the end. But I'm going to hand over to Ben for... Okay, so um, we've already used the word Mesolithic several times this evening. Um, what does that word mean? Well, simply put, the Mesolithic is a period of time. Archaeologists like to break down the historic and prehistoric past into, into chunks of time and the Mesolithic is a term we use to define a particular chunk of time in European prehistory. So the Mesolithic corresponds to hunter-gatherer groups living in Holocene temperate environments right across Europe. So the start of the Mesolithic is marked by the end of the last ice age, the end of the Pleistocene, um, around about 9,600 Cal BC, um, and it runs through to the arrival of farming and the adoption of agriculture. Now that's a bit of a movable feast when it comes to dates because people adopt farming at different points in time right across Europe, um, and also even indeed within Britain itself, uh, there's not a uniform start date for the adoption of farming. So it's quite a variable thing. So the Mesolithic is a kind of weird period that's a one, on the one hand is defined by this climatic event, on the other end extreme it's defined by a, by a social process. So it's quite unusual in that respect. Makes it a little bit slippery to define. But it's generally hunter-gatherer groups living within kind of forested temperate environments across Europe. Um, Mesolithic archaeology is fundamentally different to the archaeology of periods prior to it. So it's different from Ice Age hunter-gatherer archaeology in that it's not had to survive the Ice Age in order to be part of the archaeological record. So one of the big problems for the preservation of, of Ice Age, Pleistocene, Paleolithic sites, all the same, different words for the same thing, hunter-gatherers that were living through the last Ice Age, is that at the end of the last Ice Age, we have this period of climatic deterioration called the Younger Dryas, which is basically a thousand years of glaciers just kind of pounding the everything out of northern Europe um, and what that does is it destroys and disturbs lots of the archaeology that would have otherwise survived. Um, so start of the Holocene, anything that happens after that doesn't need to worry about the Younger Dryas messing it, messing it up, so it tends to look a little bit different. Um, we have deposits like peat bogs which are forming right from the very start of the Holocene which provide what are known as um, um, but no, no, no oxygen within, within um, no, no oxygen within peat bogs, so you don't get the deterioration of organic materials. 
Um, and so we get a different suite of materials as well as stone tools, like we found at Link's house. We also get all, uh, materials like wood, bone and antler that have been turned into material culture, um, preserving in large quantities, particularly in regions of Europe where we have really extensive peat bogs forming from the start of the Holocene, so places like southern Scandinavia. Um, and when we do get that preservation, we get amazing kind of insights into hunter-gatherers that are living in really kind of rich ecologies at these kind of temperate lake side often often kind of situate themselves near to water where you've got forests and reeds and swamps all combining to provide a really kind of rich basis of of game animals of plant resources of fish of shellfish um, and we also get sort of really kind of nice expressions of culture throughout this entire period it's really diverse and dynamic the Mesolithic is not just one thing it's lots of different types of societies and these societies have their own histories and they change through time uh, this is one of the kind of more iconic pieces from Denmark um, this kind of this, this piece of bone that's been decorated with a series of figurines um, and, and insignias sort of iconic of the Mesolithic period and some of the different forms of expression cultural expression that we see coming through the material culture at this particular time in terms of the sequence for Scotland, as I said before, the Mesolithic works slightly differently in different parts of Europe, but we can attempt to break the end of the last ice age and the, and the, and the Mesolithic down into, into several distinct phases. I've just stuck some words and some dates up here for your kind of reference to give you a sense of when these different time periods are. But the earliest Paleolithic evidence, we didn't think we had an upper Paleolithic in Scotland until about 15 years ago. So this is a really kind of new discovery, the fact that there's evidence for hunter-gatherers living in Scotland towards the end of the Ice Age. But we've now got quite a really sort of exciting emergent picture, uh, which starts with, with evidence corresponding to the Hamburgian, around about 12,700 to 12,000 Cal BC. Then it's followed by the Fedemessa, and then it's followed by the Arensbergian, which sits around 10,800 to 9,600 Cal BC. So that corresponds to that younger Dryas period, the, young, the Arensbergian. So this is really, really interesting. We're seeing hunter-gatherers moving right across northern Europe and actually kind of doing rather well for themselves, kind of ended up in all sorts of far-flung places um, at this time where the environment and the climate has really deteriorated and we've got kind of glaciers re-advancing across northern Europe and yet still people are on the move and people are inhabiting places like Scotland. And we didn't know that 15 years ago, but it's a, it's a story that Link's House is contributing to. As we move into the Holocene, as the, the, the temperature, global temperatures start to warm, um, we have the early Mesolithic period, uh, which is represented by a small number of, of mainly coastal sites um, on, in western Scotland from around 9,300 to 8,500 Cal BC. That's followed by a middle Mesolithic from around about 8,500 to 7,000 Cal BC. And then we move into what's known as the late Mesolithic, which starts around 7,000 and runs to about 5,000 Cal BC. And it's this period of late Mesolithic activity that sees a huge explosion in the number of Mesolithic sites that we find in the Outer Hebrides, um, a huge increase of sites in the Inner Hebrides, um, the Western Isles. Um, we see the first evidence of, of, of human occupation in Orkney with Link's house. And then slightly later than that, we see evidence of, of Mesolithic activity up in Shetland as well. So something big happens around about 7,000 Cal BC that leads to this big sort of explosion um, and a real kind of shift towards um, maritime journeying and, 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 a, and a real kind of uh, willingness to, to, to go to new places and set up settlements in these kind of um, in these coastal and marine areas. And then at the end of the Mesolithic, from around 5,000 to 4,000 BC, we see this, this final Mesolithic period, um, which is the kind of the period that often gets a lot of attention from later prehistorians, because it's when the first traces of farming start to arrive, and it's that story, the adaptation, the, the adoption of farming um, by, by hunter-gatherers already living in Britain. So when it comes to Mesolithic Orkney, um, this is a, just a, a, a quick map of, uh, of the Orkney Isles, uh, mainland Orkney and uh, Hoy and, and the Northern Isles as well. Um, and the dots we see here are, are different types of, of, of archaeological material that are associated with the Mesolithic. So we have random finds, so objects which we think of as being Mesolithic in date from a typological perspective, sometimes turning up in assemblages of later date, so the odd Mesolithic artefact within a Neolithic assemblage or a Bronze Age assemblage. Um, we've got kind of sites, settlement sites, the kind of thing we find at Lick's house in a, in, a, in a small number of number of instances. We've got evidence of human activity that we're seeing preserved in environmental profiles. So particularly in the late Mesolithic, we see evidence of what looks like human interference, anthropogenic interference with um, in pollen sequences. So people clearing areas of woodland, perhaps using fire to create clearings. Um, the, 
the, the standard interpretation of those actions is to create clearings that attract new growth in terms of vegetation and in turn attract gain for hunting, so it's a kind of hunting strategy. But we see that certainly in the, in the late Mesolithic in Orkney. Um, and it kind of goes against this sort of myth that the, the, the Mesolithic in Orkney is, is insubstantial or is kind of insignificant or that, you know, the, the prehistoric sequence, the prehistoric story of Orkney only really starts with the Neolithic. The Orkney Neolithic is fantastic. It's of international importance and significance. It is to be celebrated and loved and projects like Tombs of the Isles are a really great way to do that. And, and our knowledge and understanding of, of Neolithic Orkney is, is, is really rich and has been very hard fought. But that's not to say that the Mesolithic that precedes that is, not as, is, is very challenging, certainly, but, but is not as interesting or as important as what we see with the, the start of farming. Um, so to say that there, there is a Mesolithic in Orkney um, and it's quite interesting, but it's very, very different in terms of the character of the archaeology to what we see in the Neolithic. So we don't have those stone-built buildings that we see in the Neolithic. Where our structural evidence, as we'll see at Link's House, tends to be much more ephemeral, um, and that often causes archaeologists to lose interest in it, but not me, because I, I think it's fascinating. Um, another point to note in terms of the Mesolithic in Orkney is that the Mesolithic, particularly the earlier phases of the Mesolithic, the early phase of the Holocene, as the global temperature increases, the ice caps begin to melt, and so what we have is this progressive process of sea level rise. Now in higher latitudes, um, that's also counterbalanced by what we call isostatic uplift. So whilst we've got more water forming in the, sea, in the, in the oceanic systems, which you might think would lead to a sea level rise, the melting of those ice caps on the kind of top and the bottom of the Earth caused the, the surface of the planet to rebound out. And that can lead to, to, to land sort of shooting upwards at a rate that exceeds the, the rate of sea level rise you'd expect from the extra water that's going into the oceanic systems. Um, so that can make it quite complicated and difficult to plot exactly what's going on with sea level rise in the early Holocene. But um, Lake Caroline Wickham Jones and some of her colleagues, um, Richard and Martin Bates, have put an awful lot of work into this, thinking about this in Orkney, and have produced result in kind of kilometres more coastline being exposed, um, especially in, in, a, in, a, in an island like, um, lo, lo, like Stronsea, where you have such you know, kind of big, expansive bays. You can imagine those bays actually being quite, you haven't got bays, you've got flat lines of coast um, with, with sort of um, big, big areas of land exposed within those bays that aren't available to people today. So we can think about that in terms of the landscape, as I said before, in terms of the, the, the island bays and what that means for the, how big the landscape was and the areas of you know, sites we might think of being as coastal today not actually being situated on the coast during the Mesolithic. Um, and we do have this kind of this, this sort of history in terms of um, early prehistoric hunter-gatherer archaeology um, on Stronsi, and that's kind of sort of typified really or, or sort of cemented by the discovery of what's known as a tanged point um, for a millfield farm in 1956. So this is a really characteristic form of projectile point, so it's probably a type of stone arrowhead, um, but typologically it's identical to the types, kinds of projectile points we find in the Arensbergian. And the Arensbergian is this kind of hunter-gatherer culture adapted for kind of marine environments, I think sort of seal hunters um, living in kind of sort of semi-arctic conditions that are living right the way across the North Sea Basin. So we find similar bar point, similar uh, tank points in Denmark, in northern Germany, in southern Scandinavia, so the kind of the bottom of Norway um, and, and into Sweden as well. So a really kind of expansive um, a group of peoples uh, in the Arensbergian who are living through some really harsh conditions. But we've known about this presence of hunter-gatherers, or there's been evidence for these presence, presence of early hunter-gatherers um, in Stronsi since the 1950s. So it's, it's that kind of history of, of, of hunter-gatherer archaeology that has really attracted the attention of archaeologists more recently. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Dan now. All right. Cool, thanks Ben. So that's, yeah, just a good bit of context there to think about you know, how the site of Link's House sits within this much bigger story. Um, and it's that, those glimpses of, you know, the Mesolithic period in Stronzi with the finds at Millfield that led to, you know, further investigations in Stronzi um, and the discovery of Link's House. So the site, unless you, uh, some of you have been down to there today, um, the farm of Link's House is up there with the house. And then this is the area we're working in. We went for a little visit there in the field today. Um, and this is the sort of grid that we were working on. And we also did some paleo-environmental work, some coring out on the shore there, here, and we'll just touch on that briefly later. 
Um, so what I was going to do is just sort of tell the story of how and why we went um, and looked at that, that site. So it was um, Naomi Woodward, now Naomi Dempsey, who um, sort of undertook the first studies of that. And she was interested in the, um, the Mesolithic story, the Mesolithic of Orkney. Um, and obviously with those finds at Millfield, um, she was interested in doing a study in, 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 in Stronzi to see if you know, we could find more evidence of the Mesolithic. Um, and she undertook a kind of desk-based assessment and some field walking um, as the early stages of that. So she did a review of the whole of the archaeology of the island. Um, and then I got some funding and undertook some field walking in 2007. And um, I formed part of the team with that. So I sort of, I was there from sort of quite near the beginning of the, 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 the investigations. Um, and that looked at a number of fields across the islands. And I've got a slide that I'll show you where we, we looked at before. And then that led to the discovery of Lynx House. So it was, it was one of those moments in archaeology where, you know, it's, we've been out for two weeks. It's the last Friday of the last day. And then... We had this field at Lynx House that we, you know, we had, we, Dennis had said that it was okay to go in and walk the field. Um, and so we went down there, and then the top of the field, the house had been demolished, and there was lots of modern stuff lying around on the, the ploughed field surface. And we thought, oh, this doesn't, doesn't look too promising. And by the time we got down to the bottom of the field, we started to pick up small microliths and flints, and we thought, oh, this is really interesting. So we, we, we did our survey, and we picked up the pieces. There were some interesting pieces. It didn't look like a typical sort of Neolithic assemblage. And then we, we got back to the, caught the ferry, got back to the college, and looked at, reviewed the assemblage, soon realised that this was something quite different. And this was looking like a Mesolithic assemblage, which is really, really unusual in Orkney, um, as, as Ben's just been saying. So... Um, this is obviously a very significant study, a uh, very significant find. So we undertook some geophysics on the site to see if we could, there was any kind of sense of any features underneath the ground. Um, and then that led to a series of test pits, so one metre by one metre test pits across the area. And then that finally led to sort of opening up larger areas and the excavation um, that I think some of you even came to visit. Um, so unfortunately for us, when we inherited the field, it was like that. Um, and it kind of carried on like that because uh, we, we, we sort of working there at worst possible times of the year in, in March and in October. Um, so, um, so the field walking, which was a bit, the work was a bit better than field walking. So we walked 19 fields across the island, but of course field walking is where you've got a ploughed field, hopefully the field's weathered a little bit, you're picking up artefacts across the surface of the field, you're plotting where they came from, and you can find clusters or distributions of artefacts. And then that can tell you perhaps where something's been ploughed up or disturbed, and that gives you an idea about what's underneath, you know, what, what could lie underneath. And that's one of the tricks we have, because people often think, well, how do we know where to dig? Well, field walking is a really good, simple way of doing it, and we're, we're, we're hoping to maybe do a bit more in Stronzi coming up, so there's something we're looking into at the moment. Um, but, of course, it doesn't just find Mesolithic finds. Amazingly, Naomi set out to find the Mesolithic of Orkney or Stronzi, and she found it, which is incredible, because it really is a needle in a haystack stuff. But of course what we did find was other evidence for the Neolithic and other evidence for prehistoric activity as well. So we found a Neolithic settlement up here at Midgarth, um, so other prehistoric skin flint scatters here, another Mesolithic microlith down here, and some other prehistoric flint scatters up here as well. So you know this sort of work does help build up that bigger picture about you know unknown sites and different um, you know activity areas across the island. But of course that all paled into insignificance because of finding the, 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 um, uh, the Mesolithic finds at Lynx House. So um, this is that grid that I showed you before in the field, so honing in now. So this is the same grid, same size grid here. So this is our geophysics. This is magnetometry, so it picks up um, diff very, very fine differences in magnetism in the ground. And you're talking like that's plus or minus one or two nanotesla, so tiny differences. But if you've got burning, if you've got kind of hearths or middens, it can pick that up. Um, the geophysics of this site didn't really show uh, much. These, all these black dots are um, iron spikes and bits of metal in the ground, because of course it picks up metal as well. And this is a kind of natural geological feature. So this technique didn't work, but it did perhaps show us that we didn't have lots of burning underneath the ground. But as part of the, the next phase, we started to undertake test pits. Um, we excavated 34 test pits across the grid. So that was used to sort of test out some of the geophysical anomalies, and then you know, we would find the bit of iron just to test that it was working, testing out some of those other areas. But also it soon led us, to, we took a sort of more dynamic approach to the test pits, um, and it soon led us to where there were higher concentrations of lint, flints or lithics in the topsoil. And then that allowed us to hone ourselves in quite rapidly on this area, and you can see some of the, you know, the higher concentrations in this area as well. 
So to, I'm not going to focus on trench B here because we had a higher concentration of lithics in the topsoil, but we didn't really find anything underneath that. So um, what I'm going to focus on in the talk is trench A, which is where we found the occupation site. Um, so we started off, these are pictures of some of the test pits, you can just get an idea of um, how we excavated it. So because a lot of mesolithic sites, there's a lot of lithics, a lot of it gets um, kind of turned into the topsoil, we were excavating on a grid, so we excavated in metre squares, we saved all that, all that topsoil, put it into bags, wheelbarrowed it across the muddy field along planks and bits of anything that we could find, um, and then we wet sieved it, and we kind of washed all the soil out, and then we could dry that residue, the, the stone and the flints, and then we could pick out all the different lithics. So we were doing that on site. Dennis very kindly lets us use his shed. So we, Naomi was kind of, we were drying them out, she was sorting through them, but that gave us a real sense for what we were finding in each metre square and where we should be extending the trench, because it wasn't immediately apparent where we opened the site up. We didn't kind of hit on the, the kind of really intense area of occupation. So the, the following the lithics was quite an important way of us uh, exposing the whole area of the site. Um, so yes, it was, it was challenging, because um, as you'll come to see, we were digging very, very small, tiny little cut features in very clay ground, where the water is actually physically coming out of the ground almost faster than we can sponge it away. Um, and that was our trench pretty much every morning, and we had a pump, and we pumped it all out. Um, we couldn't really bring any machines in the field because it, it was a real mess as it was and they would have just got stuck. So we opted for this kind of like, you know, um, option of barrowing it, but once you got used to it, it got you fit certainly. Um, so it was the kind of manual labour of moving the soil to be sieved, but there was the very fine, delicate work of actually excavating um, the features. But you can see this area here, this is one of the main areas um, during the final phases of excavation. You can see um, that the clay underneath has this sort of mottling, this stain. It's not actually a deposit. We did find a kind of occupation deposit, and I'll show that in a bit. But it's this kind of staining of the, the till, the, the underlying clay, that, that also gave us a hint to occupation. Um, so because it's such a long period of time, a lot of that material sort of leached and settled into the, the clay underneath. See the trench at the top there, so 2008, and then we extended it much more to the, to the left-hand side there in 2009 to expose um, more of the um, features. Um, so this is our main, this is our trench. So this is the, these are the main um, structures here, three, two, one. Um, we've got the little group here, a post hole, some animal burrows, which are a bit later, but there's a very good post hole there. We did get a, a small scatter of lithics in the topsoil there. Um, I'm not going to focus so much on some of these other more ephemeral, the odd post hole and stake hole here. Um, so this is a plan view, obviously, looking from above. So these are the different feature types, post holes, stake holes. And we had some very, very shallow scoops. But the whole site, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons we actually excavated it, and we got the funding to excavate it, because... Um, there was a need to drain the field, so there was a, the, the, um, the farmer was going to try and put um, mole drains in, which obviously destroyed the site. Which um, um, so that threat enabled us to get the, um, the, the, the funding to excavate it. But you know, you can see because of all the recent activity, there's, there's wheel ruts running right across the site here. There's actually a modern ditch that we found that was cut into the side of the site, um, and the whole site you could see plough scars across it. Um, but the field, I mean, I think the field has been certainly ploughed since the Second World War, but it's probably not been ploughed too much and not been ploughed that intensively. But what happened when it was brought into a more intensive cult, modern cultivation with deeper ploughs was it seems so that a lot of them, the topsoil suddenly kind of like um, to went down the slope and actually thickened above the site. So out of that ploughing, although there was initial damage, this thicker layer of topsoil actually helped preserve the site. So some bits it was a bit thinner, but a lot of the site, you know, the topsoil was about that depth. So the active plough zone is maybe about six to nine inches, and then underneath that we had this fairly compacted topsoil, and actually that lower layer contained a huge amount of lithics. And what we found was actually that the, the flint in the topsoil hadn't moved too far horizontally, it made, moved, moved up and down a lot more. And I'll show you some nice um, diagrams of the, 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 the lithic distributions um, uh, in a bit. But I'll, I'll, what I wanted to do was just talk you through some of these, these structures now. Because you can see that you know, there are a lot of, kind of groups. I mean, this, this one here is, I think I've got a picture of that one there. You can see it's much more of a sort of linear arrangement of stake holes. Perhaps it's some sort of like windbreak or, or structure like that. You've got a lot more scoops, and there's these sort of double stake holes here. That dotted area is actually an occupation layer, so a very thin layer of much more 
you know, a darker material that did contain some, some lithics, but it was all very much merging in with the clay below. It's not very well defined at all. Um, but a lot of these features were very well defined, and we had a professional team excavating them. Some of them were really small, but some of them had really, really obvious kind of reddish brown clay, um, uh, sandy clay deposits inside the stake holes compared to the sort of orangey yellow um, clay around the outside. So even though they look very small, when you start digging them, you can find sometimes they went down to a really neat point um, where you had literally just put a stake in the ground and then it had been removed for building structures. And we'll, we've got a sort of reconstruction of what one of these structures might look like. I'll just quickly whiz through some of these. Um, so there's Sarah. Um, that's what that looked like in excavation. So you can see a very thin layer of material in the middle surrounded by a series of stake holes and features. Um, so using very fine um, you know, trowels to excavate that. Um, so this is this line of uh, stake holes here running along the trench. So you can see the sort of mottled um, uh, clay underneath, but these, these were very well defined stake holes, and these ones appear to have all been pulled out at the same time. They're filled with the same very sandy fill, suggesting that they may have got material that's blowing up from possibly the, the, the sea and the dune system that's possibly getting closer to the site. But so, in terms of Mesolithic archaeology, we're at the site today thinking, you know, it's not like a standing stone, you know, stone circle, it's not like a big Neolithic tomb, it's some very, very ephemeral stakes and, and post holes in the ground. Um, so it's quite, a, you know, in terms of the physical evidence of the site, it's quite subtle. It's over there. So this is an overall plan. It's, I realise putting this up, it's slightly kind of like, uh, uh, you know, subjective. But it's just to try and show you a bit more detail. There was this, this hollow in the middle, which did actually have a sort of clay, uh, clay, more clay layer filling it, which sealed other, other features. So what that meant was we could say, actually, there's different phases to this. And this is a story across this site. This site. All those features in those structures were not all there, you know, they didn't all contain stakes and, and structure at the set structures at the same time. What we're finding was there was repeated, there were repeated visits and a repeated maintenance of structures on that site. And we'll think about what that means in a moment, but what it, you know, what it suggests is you've got people that are going there, returning to that same spot, rebuilding, perhaps they've left the poles or the frames in place, they've taken the skins and the coverings, and they're going back. Um, you know, season upon season to the same spot. Some of the stake holes were angled, so you could see that they're putting stakes in at angles like this, possibly to strengthen and to, um, uh, and you can see where some of them have been pulled out because you've got a really well defined side on one side and then it's got the kind of bit that's ripped up on the other side. So within these, we had like, you know, there are quite a lot of different phases um, based on the stratigraphic evidence, which is again quite unusual. So this is, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a reconstruction that Caroline had drawn up for one of her publications, which gives you a sense of what these things could have looked like. I mean, it's, it's subject, you know, again, we don't, we're not quite sure whether they had a kind of pitched roof like that or whether they were more like a bender. You might have seen, you know, um, uh, you know sort of, sort, of, uh, sort of gypsy bender. You might have seen some of those ones that where really they have that kind of like curved poles over the top like that. Um, but one really important thing about the site is when we did the test pitting, we did some soil micromorphology on the clay that goes under the site because there weren't really any deposits that we could do this with in the site because they were all so thin. Um, and the specialist at Ian Simpson at Stirling University looked at the soil. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing that they can do this, but they can look at the microstructure of the soil and work out how it, and the deposits and work out how it formed and what's in it. And from that, he could see these little micro kind of rootlets and micro, um, uh, micro evidence that this was actually a wooded area, which is obviously a really big, important part of why we think this site was there. You know, it's possibly, a, you know, it's not like that picture at the top, but it's like that, but within a, a kind of birch, hazel, pine, woodland. So, you know, in terms of thinking about what Stronzi was like then, and we were looking at that when we were standing at the top near the school looking over today, that whole area was a patchwork of woodland. And, they, you know, this, these communities were to returning to the same cleared space in the woodland, perhaps connected by a series of routeways and paths between other places on a regular basis. Sense of what it looked like on the ground. Again, there's, there's Sarah trying to excavate the little kind of very, so you can see the kind of outline of the deposit there, very ephemeral stuff. And then within, around that, there's that series of stake holes. So there's another structure up there, structure three. And then you can see this is quite a well defined group here, group two, some of the largest stake holes, like really big double stake holes. Quite a slightly different layout, almost a slightly squared. You see, it's almost like got a kind of diamond shape or squared <coughs> shape, whereas the others seem to be slightly more circular or oval around a, a very slight hollow 
Um, and then over here we've got some of these other double stair coils and other features um, which were you know, surrounded by these little scoops. <coughs> so just to show you that in a little bit more detail, so we're trying to unpick some of the different phases um, within the, within the stakehold distribution there. But again, it's showing us that we've got this repeated construction and maintenance of these structures in the same spot. Um, and that's just to show that other structure that Sarah was excavating there. So again, we had a layer in the top of the feature which sealed other stakeholds underneath. Again, giving us this idea that, that, that there's different phases to these structures. So the same sort of story across the site. Um, and this area of the site, over the side here, where we have these double stake holes, you can see there's like an occupation layer, very thin, just slightly more stained clay, really, um, in that part of the site. But this is where we think the half area was. And we, there was no half surviving in, site, in, in situ. You know, in the Neolithic, we get these lovely square, kind of like stone arrangements with the half in the middle, really, really obvious. In the Mesolithic, they didn't tend to have formalised, structured half areas. They tended to be surface half, so the fire was kind of built on an area which moved around, so the material from that was kind of spreading about. Um, so, how did we find the, the material in the topsoil? So, this was, uh, this was some of the team's job was wearing goggles and getting your oil skins on and there's the sheds out the back with our um, hoses and then we had a couple of pressure washers um, with, with meshes and so we were bringing all the soil back, pressure washing it through and then picking out all the lithics from those on site and that then gave us the, you know, gave us the added clues as to what we're finding and the distribution, the concentrations. And I started to build these, some of these sort of distribution maps on site and that was helping us kind of like understand you know where the site was kind of finishing. So we're finding that the the, the, the lithic constant, the high lithic concentrations in the topsoil top were very closely um, correlated to the structures. So in the end, this is what we can produce. So if you remember, this is where I had that dot saying the half was. So this is with these double stake holes. So you can see you've got really high concentrations of lithic. So in one meter square, there we've got over 1,200 lithics in one meter square, and what? One, two, three metres away, we're down to 100. So when I'm saying the stuff's not moving very far horizontally, it's moving vertically, you know, I think we can quite confidently relate the, 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 the lithic material from the topsoil to the features and the structures underneath. Um, we did get about 1,000 or so lithics from the, the post hole fills and the, 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 the stake holes and the, the, the occupation layers, but very small chips and chunks and that kind of thing. So we did get lithics in the deposits, but the majority of them um, were from um, the topsoil. So in, in total there's over 26,000 lithics from the site, um, with about 1,000 or so of them from actual deposits. Um, so you know, when we start to look at this, we can start to see where they were doing things. And when we say this is a stoneworking site, we can say where they were doing this stoneworking um, in that, very much concentrated on that area around those, you know, it doesn't appear to be a, a built structure. These are probably like A-frames around the hearth or other, other structures. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's the burnt flint. So in terms of us saying where that hearth is, um, you know, this is all the burnt material. So you can see it's very strongly correlated to that area. There are other little patches around of burnt material, um, but you know, in terms of us saying where the hearth was, well, it, it, you know, maybe it's not exactly on that hot spot because it could be that they're working material, dragging material out of the hearth, but it's in that in that vicinity. Um, so I was going to hand over to Ben to have a little talk through some of the material that we found. Um, the back. So after this, we could have a we could show you some of those. Um, I'm going to sit there. Well, sure. Okay, so uh, in terms of the artefacts that have been recovered, as I mentioned before, we don't have any organic preservation at the site, or particularly good organic preservation at the site. So what we're left is with is the stone tools that people were using at the site. Now we know ethnographically, anthropologically, that groups of hunter-gatherers that use stone tools today, stone tools make up about five to ten percent of their overall material repertoire. So we're we're lacking ninety percent of the things that these people made and used and lived alongside. But we've got the stone tools, so the stone tools are what we focus on, but it's just important to bear in mind that these aren't people that are only capable of, of using and working stone. 
That's the point I want to make. So the stone tools are, are really, really interesting. They're, they're the types of stone tools that we find in the main at other Mesolithic sites in Orkney, but the way in which the site's been excavated and the, the volume of material allows us to say some slightly different things about what people are doing there. So we can see in Lynn's house there's evidence for the making of microliths. So microliths are this <coughs> particular type of stone tool that we find characterising the Mesolithic right across Northern Europe. So it's this kind of idea that people have at the end of the last ice age to start making these kind of Lego type stone technologies. So they're really kind of tiny little different shapes, often geometric shaped, small pieces of flint uh, that are very carefully shaped into particular forms um, using particular techniques and then they can be assembled into lots and lots and lots of different types of composite tool. So you can make them into hundreds of different forms of arrowhead if you wanted to, and then you can disassemble them, and you can then have them into a knife that can be used for processing vegetables, and you can disassemble them, and you can put them back together to form linings for, for traps for, for, for high-bearing animals. So you can, you, you can disassemble them and then create scraping tools for scraping hides. So all sorts of different ways, a really flexible technology, um, and there are lots of different forms of microlith we find across Britain, um, across Northern Europe, and across Scotland. What's really interesting is when we get to Orkney, we don't find the full range of microlith types that we find elsewhere in Scotland in particular. Okay? So the kinds of microliths we find are obliquely blunted points, backed bladelets, and that's about it. So these two very specific forms of microlith that people are, produ are making, clearly making them at Link's house, and they're using them within the landscape, they're using them right across Orkney, but there's a whole range of other types of microliths, things like scaling triangles, isosceles triangles, normally named after the shapes of the, of the tools, so they're not massively imaginatively named, but different types of microlith, and what we find in Orkney is that the, the range of microliths being produced is quite restricted, which is really, really interesting. It asks two questions, really. What are microliths for? So why is it that, is it, is it because people are only doing a certain, a restricted range of tasks in Orkney compared to other parts of Scotland? You know, so is this Orkney forming part of a wider pattern of movement? People come to Orkney to do certain things and they only need back bladelets and ability blunted points to do those things. Or is the making of these microliths part of what it means to be an Orcadian hunter-gatherer in the Mesolithic. So is this a way that people distinguish themselves from the other groups of hunter-gatherers that are living in Caithness, in, the, in Shetland, in the, other, in, 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 the, in the Western Isles, who they're going to be in contact with at various um, points in their life um, if they want to avoid having a very, very small gene pool. So really, really interesting stories coming from the artefacts. We're finding, so, so as I say, we've got the microlith forms. We've also got lots of evidence for the production of the stone tools. So we find the blade cores, um, which are the kind of the core pieces of flint that are used to remove the thin um, flint blades, which are then broken to produ produce the microliths. We've got the hammer stones, which are the big sort of striking cobbles that people use to strike the flint and remove those flakes and blades. We've got all the mess that that process produces, and we can have a look at some of that on the back table um, in terms of debitage. Um, and then we've got burnt flint as well, which flint that seems to have been either uh, placed within kind of hearth deposits, and that might be as a process a way of altering the, the fracturing properties of the flint, and the flint, flint, flint properties changes if you, if you burnt it, or it might be just a process of middling, so collecting rubbish together and dumping it in the fire. We're not entirely sure. I'm avoiding talking about them because uh, I think they get far too much attention, but one of the most, one of the most high profile finds from Link's house are the tanged points, okay? So we've got the two up there, and, and these are the kind of the, the, the finds that really launched the site. So in the initial field walking, it was the identification of tanged points um, in the assemblage that Naomi and Dan um, originally recovered that led to kind of whoops of delight and the, 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 the kind of recognition that this is a site of real significance. Because the tang points don't actually correspond to Mesolithic material culture, they're actually Arensbergian. They're actually late Upper Paleolithic they correspond to people who are coming to Orkney during the Younger Dryas, and they're actually from what looks like an earlier phase of occupation. We don't have any Harrisburgian dates, so we can't say for sure exactly when this happens, but they tie into the broader story of hunter-gatherer groups, those kind of 
folk I mentioned before, these sort of marine adapted, cold climate, um, specialised hunter-gatherer groups who are moving right across northern Europe um, and seem to be doing really well exploiting marine mammals such as seals. Um, we're finding evidence for them in the Western Isles, finding evidence for them in Orkney, multiple sites across northern Scotland, as well as the kind of the traditional Arensbergian heartlands of, of Denmark and, and northern Germany, um, bits of France, southern Scandinavia. They get around a lot, but this is the kind of thing that we just didn't think we had in Scotland until about 15 years ago, so really, really important site, really, really important contribution. Um, although I don't want it to overshadow what it's telling us about the Orcadian Mesolithic, which is a level of detail that we can't go into um, using just these kind of isolated typological finds. Uh, we should be more excited about this stuff. Um, yeah, some more examples of the material and we can have a look at some of that on the, on the back table and we can talk about the kinds of finds that the, the site was producing. Here's an example of a reconstructed um, arrowhead and arrow shaft using microliths and you can see the ways in which, you know, you, by using kind of mastics, adhesives, um, a wooden shaft, you can start to put together some really sort of sophisticated different types of arrowheads and we see ethnographically arrows which are specifically adapted for fowling, for hunting birds, for hunting um, animals that produce furs, for meat game, um, and adapted for, for all those kind of different technical challenges that those prey species produce. Having a collection of microliths that you can haft in all sorts of different ways is really useful. Here's a nice experimental reconstruction um, that we produced as part of the Star Car project. And again, you can see people making these viciously sharp and then barbed projectile points um, in all sorts of different arrangements, depending on the prey that they're, that they're hunting. Come back over to you, Dan. It was just to uh, point out that we, you know, some of these tools are, and, and scrapers and oh, not scrapers, sorry, uh, microliths and cores. You know, if we if there's the shape of the site, we can because we collected stuff on those metre squares, we can start to look at where pe perhaps people were doing and making some of these tools actually on on the site. Um, so the top one there is back blades, and you can see, you know, again. The back blade production is really heavily focused on that half area. Um, you can see some of the, the other kind of cores and tools. Um, so the cores are the different colours. So there's different types of cores, which I'm not going to go into now. The cores, you've got a really good example of the back. So like a fist-sized piece of flint or even smaller. But it's taking these flakes off around the, around the sides like that. So it's quite a specific type of, of working. And this is where we're finding the cores. So the cores are concentrated around, but maybe not right in the middle of this, this flint working area. They may be concentrated around it a bit more. Um, and at the top there, you can see other kind of microliths and other tools, and um, maybe a bit more of a spread around the site. But you know, this sort of level of detail is really, really important, especially because we can relate that to the um, the uh, Mesolithic structures as well and what people were doing in and around this site. Um, sorry, Ben. Yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a much, you know, I mean, Ben's just covered this, really, because um, there's, there's a much more detailed picture of the town points. Um, so, I mean, the point you're making about, you know, these wider connections to Europe or are these kind of local manifestations of this kind of much broader lithic working tradition that we're finding ending up in, here in Stronzi. And we've got the tang points at the back, so you can, you can have a look at those. Um, so that's a bit of background to the site, that's a bit of the wider context, we've looked at some of the finds. So just to look at how we dated it, because this is one of the key things that we managed to do at Lynx House. And that's only made possible by finding organic material. So we did find some organic material, but the only organic material we found is when it's burnt. So um, there's a technique we use called radiocarbon dating. So that works on when anything organic dies. So you know, an animal or a human or a plant, the, once that dies, the carbon kind of decays at a steady rate and you can, from, from that point of death. And you can, you can measure that carbon decay. And from the measuring that carbon decay, you can tell the, the age of death, if you like. So you can date when a tree um, was alive, was growing, um, and you can date when a hazelnut, you know, that's more accurate because that was alive for a year, whereas a tree could be alive for four, five, six hundred years if you're talking about these massive trees. So, um, so we did recover some of this material from Lynx House. It's great that they had their hearth because they're obviously burning stuff. And this is another bit of evidence they're obviously burning cooking hazelnuts. Maybe they're snacking at the site. Um, certainly they're within woodland, so it's giving us another insight into the, the resources that they were collecting. So the first dates we got to, from Lynx House in the first stage um, actually were from this feature up here. 
So when we, we, we dated some charcoal from a very, very small feature, but that was important because it gave us this hook to be able to carry on excavating the site. But these dates came back quite late Mesolithic, around about sort of 4,000... 4,500 BC, which is fine. You know, we thought this is a late Mesolithic site. Slightly confusing because we had these tang points, but, you know. Um, but when we started to work on the kind of the larger settlement area, the dates from the... And this is where we found the hazelnut shells. These hazelnut shells, I'm cheating, they're not actually from Lynx House, they're from another Mesolithic site I worked on in Skye. But you kind of get the idea. You can see these little fragments of shell that are very heavily charred. Um, this is what we were finding. Not, we, obviously, we wouldn't date that from the topsoil because you can't guarantee that it's actually from the features. So we're finding these from the samples that we took from the occupation spreads and actually in the stakeholders. So we can definitely say that they're from the time that the site was used or in, in its early stages of disuse. Um, and those dates are the ones that came back to a very late 8th, a very early 7th millennium BC, so 7,000 BC. So these, this, is, this is the sort of main date of the site. We think this might just be a very late phase of occupation at the site, going on the similar form of these, these, certainly these two structures and the cohesion of this area with the kind of other structures and the hearth area. We think that this is all contemporary and we think it dates to the seventh, um, 7,000 BC. We think this is just a, a late, and it's a different material, it could be intrusive, um, but it's a very late phase of occupation at the site. And with radiocarbon dates, when you have a whole series of dates, you can model it, you can clip the kind of error out of it. So we've had a specialist do that. And we think that the site was in use for around about 200 years. So, you know, if you break that down into generations, 40 years, life expectancy maybe, in the Mesolithic, you could be looking at five, ten generations of the same group or the same kind of you know, community of people that were kind of using the, the, the ranging this whole area and using this this place. But then, for whatever reason or the evidence that we can find, they're not coming back to Lynx House anymore. But again, this shows that we've got this quite intense, relatively intense period of use when they're rebuilding structures on the same site. These structures may not have all stood at the same time. It might have been quite a small group returning to the same place repeatedly on hunting missions, making tools, um, hunting animals in the woodland, collecting resources, eating hazelnuts, clearly, um, and then moving on. Um, so we don't know whether it was slightly, a slightly larger group that had more than one structure. But what we know is they're certainly returning to this place. They're perhaps undertaking the same sorts of tasks, doing the same sorts of things within this woodland clearing for at least uh, possibly 200, possibly even 300 years. So that's a really important thing because that's dated our assemblage and it dates all this, these lithics and the tang points to around about that time. Um, so just to kind of look at this on a kind of like linear kind of like timeline, if you like, you've got Lynx House Strunzi there sort of 7,050, 6,050 BC. There's, there is another dated site in Orkney. Um, <coughs> Lynx House comes out earlier, so don't worry. Um, just slightly later, 6,800, 6,600 BC. That was a, a site that Caroline Wick and Jones excavated at Longhow, which is near Minehow, which is the big Iron Age site in, um, in Tankness, in the east mainland of Orkney. Um, but that site, they did get one or two tiny traces of um, uh, bits of hazelnut shell which allowed them to date it. But that site had been disturbed by a Bronze Age burial mound, a Bronze Age barrow. So when they excavated that, they found um, microliths. They sieved an awful lot of Bronze Age material and they came up with these hazelnut shells. So that was a lot of hard work. But they did get these dates. But it was a site, there was no structures, not unlike Lynx House, where we got all these you know, stake holes and, 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 and structures. Then we have a massive gap. And then we have our very late dates from Lynx House. And we also have some late dates, um, some you know, late Mesolithic, very late Mesolithic dates from a, underneath another burial mound in the mainland at Farmdale. Um, but we have this massive gap of like 3,000 years between um, you know, that first intensive use at Lynx House and we do have a date for, for Long Howe. Um, so we know that there are communities, and these are, you know, this is this is on the mainland of Orkney. So we know we have a population. We know we have groups um, in Orkney at that time. But then we have nothing in between. They, they must have been there, but we don't have anything dated. And then we're into the kind of Neolithic, the early Neolithic, when you first get the first timber buildings. So again, we've got stake holes and post holes um, around a half setting at sites like Wideford. We've got, then we get the stone-built houses. But early on in the, in the Neolithic, you're getting the tombs of the first 
stone built buildings. The first tomb builders were living in wooden houses, but they soon started to build stone houses. Um, so this is, this is our kind of sequence. So you can see how important Link's house is in terms of um, this sequence, because really it is that, that really early evidence of settlement and it's dated um, in, in Orkney and indeed in the far north of Scotland. Um, just to mention, we had a look at this at the beach today, just to mention um, some of the other work that we did at the time. Um, so there's our site. Um, you know, if you walk along Mill Bay, you can see that this peat deposit eroding out. You know, it's, a lot of it's covered with sand at the moment. The sand's been blown up against it, but you know, it's been there for a long time. There's a lot of active erosion on that part of the site. So when we found the Mesolithic site, we were like, oh, this is it. We've got a beautiful freshwater loch right by our Mesolithic site. This is perfect. And we can get lots of beautiful environmental information from the peat that's in, in our nearby loch. And they, we can imagine them all going out hunting game and wild fowl fat, on the loch. And um, So we got Stirling University involved and we took these columns of the deposits um, from the peat and they did lots of analysis on the sand blow and they can date the organic material in the peat because of course it's preserved as Ben was saying that these are anaerobic conditions um, we were looking at that, that change in the environment where the dark layers of peat suddenly get interleaving layers of sand coming in and then the peat kind of boggy conditions fight back and then the sand comes in and eventually the dune system takes over and the environment's changed um, but you know, unfortunately we couldn't have our cake and eat it because the dates that came back um, for the, the peat deposits and this, this loch are actually Bronze Age. So it's still really interesting, still says an interesting thing about perhaps how the landscape changed and shifted as the sea was encroaching, the dune systems were encroaching, filling in some of these lochs. As we we're looking at today, perhaps it gives us a hint of some of the freshwater lochs that might have been slightly further out in the big bays and Stronzi that, that the community at Link's House were exploiting. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't done that. So we did coring around the area, we mapped it pretty close to the site, so it would have been very cool if it was Mesolithic, because they'd have been sat right on the edge of this loch, um, but that wasn't to be. So we really are looking at an inland site in Woodland, and that's been confirmed by, by this um, paleoenvironmental survey. There's the spoiler. So just to kind of, you know, it seems a bit crazy to me in terms of trying to compare the structures that we've got at Lynx House with, you know, other communities that were living around about that time in Fife, Isla, um, Lanarkshire, Colonsey and Rum because of course they had virtually no connection but they were using similar technologies they were building state built structures um, but you can see that, you know, there, there really are very few this isn't all of them but there are very few um, you know, evidence of structures from that time so at Morton you can see you've got like lines of stake holes you've got some sort of feature in the ground here you've got spreads of stone you know, you're looking at just kind of pit features with stones arcs of stake holes you know, you think what we've got at Lynx House in terms of some of those structures, you know, um, and the, the scoops and the features, you know, an arc of stake holes is a structure, whereas we've got these really dense clusters with stratigraphic sequences in there as well. So you can just see compared to these, if we just compare it like on, on just basis of the quality of the, and the richness of the archaeology, then, you know, you can see <coughs> the wealth of, of information that we've got from Lynx House. So I'm going to hand it to Ben for his yeah. tents. Okay, yeah, so that's the, that's the archaeology of the site, really. I guess it kind of, um, you've got a sense of what the archaeological evidence is from Link's house, um, what, what kind of material we've been working with. And I guess it's a nice opportunity for me now to just to present, um, especially someone who's relatively new to, to Orcadian archaeology, an interpretation of what, why, why that's interesting, what, what this archaeology is telling us about life in the Mesolithic, and actually what this archaeology is telling us about the, the longer sequence of prehistory and, and, and broader scale changes that we can see in societies throughout the prehistoric sequence um, here in Orkney. Uh, yeah, so we get on with this. Um, so, basically, uh, what we've got evidence for at Link's house is people living in tents. And if I say to you that someone lives in a tent today, that's a, a, a style of living that often comes with a lot, all, all sorts of kind of preconceptions and assumptions. We often associate people living in tents today as being sort of destitute, as being kind of impoverished, living on the margins of society. This is a, um, this is a PhD student from Rohantam University, um, Amy Lee, who has uh, made the news in 2021 um, because she was uh, on a teaching scholarship at Rohantam University teaching undergraduates on a fixed term contract um, and she couldn't afford rent in London so she was living in a tent and this was a, you know, sort of a, a sort of heartbreaking tale and she was saying this is the, 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 the cost of, of, 
of the university system for, for kind of young early career stage teachers that she was effectively homeless and, and living in woods and, and, and going into the university to teach students. Um, and that's the way we tend to think of people living in tents within our society today. But what I want to present to you is it's kind of an alternative to that and uh, sort of make the case for why living in tents is, particularly in hunter-gatherer societies, not only a really sensible thing, it's not something you do because you haven't thought of how to build a stone house. Um, it's something that offers all sorts of advantages, um, particularly towards a certain kind of political system and a certain kind of way of life. So I'm just going to talk about that now. So one of the things that characterises um, some hunter-gatherer societies, not all hunter-gatherer societies, but some, that's been talked about quite extensively, I chat a, a, a German anthropologist called Thomas Whitlock, um, is the idea of demand sharing, okay? And you often see this kind of popping up in sort of Marxist narratives of kind of um, primitive egalitarianism and the, the idea that kind of hunter-gatherer societies are kind of original affluent societies and within hunter-gatherer societies everything is egalitarian, every, everybody's equal and they share everything um, kind of equally um, and kind of putting that in terms of a kind of evolutionary progression through different forms of society in, in, in kind of Marxist narratives. Demand sharing is absolutely not that. Demand sharing um, from Whitlock's writing is, um, is really, really chaotic and really stressful. And it basically consists of someone coming to a campfire from a distance um, with some game and everyone turns to them and say, oh, I see you've got some food. Can I have some of your food? And they say, no. And then they say, please. And they say, no. And then after a series of this for, for several hours, There'll be a long negotiation of, oh, but I gave you some food the other week and I did let you stay in my tent a couple of weeks ago when you were passing through and let you stay and, and, um, and it's fine, you can, stay, you can stay with us again tonight, don't worry about it. Okay, fine, whatever, have some food, just shut up and leave me alone, take some of this food. And it's that process that's constantly going on of kind of interpersonal negotiation that demands a really high level of flexibility. So you have to be able to, in order for that to work, you have to be able to walk away from people. So if people are annoying you, if they're pushing it too much, you have to be able to be able to just walk, walk away and go and find your own space um, and not be reliant on staying within a set place or within a, within a certain settlement. You have to be able to quite rapidly extend hospitality to, to newcomers, um, but also withdraw hospitality from newcomers. Um, and the thing about tents and light structures, the kind of forms of architecture that we see at Link's House, is that they afford all of those options to people. The other thing that we see at Link's House, um, which is a point that was made by um, a woman called Leslie McFadgen um, in the sort of early 2000s, uh, is this kind of creation of open space architecture. Okay, so the idea of the hearth being this kind of free form space within the centre of the settlement that is accessible to everyone, and as Dan's shown within, in terms of the history of the site, um, seems to undergo a series of transformations. It's not a Neolithic hearth that's closely bound by, by set stones. Um, it's a hearth that can get bigger and it can get smaller and sometimes it might die out. But it's this, this open and accessible space that exists between tent structures um, that brings people together. And that's something that um, David Friesman and, and Noah Levy have written about in their kind of quite extensive examination of sharing as a practice within anthropo anthropologically documented hunter-gatherers and also the archaeological record as well. And they've noticed that the site structure among foragers seems to manifest a social preference to ensure maximum sharing, co-presence and living together. So exactly that preference for open, accessible public spaces that allow people to come together but also the ability to negotiate that a tent affords you in terms of to literally up sticks and walk away if people are getting a bit too much for you, but to make space and take space away um, when guests arrive, when guests might have outstayed their welcome. It's a really, really interesting, different approach to architecture that obviously works for people for big chunks of prehistory um, and is a really sensible solution if you have a society that is based around the distribution of resources um, on a kind of... A, a, a kind of a, not as perhaps invested in kind of personal property and ownership as we might have in our society today. So that's the idea that um, Graham Warren's been developing and applying to um, some of the kind of mobile tent-based architecture that he sees in Ireland, and I think is really relevant for Lynx House. What's really cool about that idea in an Orcadian setting is it casts the arrival of stone wooden and later the stone-built architecture, I think, in quite a different light. So we can start to think of, if tents are all about sharing and social flexibility, what does the stone-built architecture that we see arriving in the middle Neolithic really kind of mean in terms of the things that people are turning their back on being able to do, the things that they're embracing 
a thousand years earlier uh, during the Mesolithic. Well, we can start to think about the idea of permanence, that abandonment, perhaps, of being able to up sticks and move on with quite the same level of flexibility, an abandonment of the flexibility and hospitality that we can see in the Mesolithic. So, structures like this um, and that power, they really do have a limited, comfortable capacity. And if 30 people turn up um, to stay at your house unexpectedly, there's going to be some trouble. You're going to have to be some sorting out and negotiation. Some people are going to be able to stay um, in the Stonebill house, um, and some people might not be able to. Or you might be able to get everyone in, but it won't quite be as comfortable as everyone would have liked it to have been. And that's telling us something a little bit different, I think, in terms of the way in which people are treating each other and regarding their own personal space. So this is not just an investment in um, a warm building technology, a technology that keeps you warm and shelters you from the elements and does all the, the fantastic architectural things that, that, that stone buildings seem to be doing in the Neolithic. They are really, really interesting. Um, but it's also a limiting of options and a, perhaps an abandonment of some of those core values and a move towards privacy and kind of personal or, or at least household-based independence that we just don't see in the Mesolithic where the situation seems to be much more fluid and we're seeing that reflected in these kind of um, tent-built architectures and a preference for large communal public accessible outdoor spaces. So I think that's really interesting. I think that's something that we can kind of be bearing in mind. And there's a lot, of bit, a lot of work to do there in terms of fitting in what these kind of larger timber buildings in the early Neolithic, how they relate to this kind of wider pattern, um, whether what we're seeing here in terms of the Mesolithic and the Neolithic is um, a change in population, which has been mooted by, the, by a lot of the ADNA studies. So whether it's, you know, these ideas are disappearing with groups of people kind of large scale, or whether, there's a, whether, whether it's a kind of a, a, a choosing to abandon them by groups of people that are sticking around throughout Orkney throughout this period of time. I think there's also changes in attitudes towards mobility. Um, there's some really interesting stories in terms of Orkney being this, 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 this kind of landmass that is populated and perhaps also abandoned at various points during the Mesolithic. Mesolithic's a big chunk of time, so there's plenty of time for... You could have Orkney being occupied for centuries in the Mesolithic and then abandoned for centuries and then reoccupied for centuries and then abandoned for a thousand years and people can come back. You know, we could start to see hints of that perhaps in those big gaps in the dates, um, but that's okay. Um, and we can still see those patterns of islands being abandoned and reoccupied and perhaps you know, that's something we need to think about, you know, placing that in context of the processes that are happening across Orkney today, but that's something that is, we can see throughout the prehistoric sequence. Um, people leaving an island or, or a landmass not necessarily that being forever and permanent and being open to the idea of resettlement later down the line might not be a bad thing at all. The other thing that I think uh, Lynx House brings to um, Stronti in particular uh, is this really kind of unique chapter in, in, the, in, the, in the story, in the history of the island, in the, in the kind of narrative, the, the, the heritage narrative that you can tell about the island. And it's interesting because it brings in hunter-gatherers, okay? So hunter-gatherers are kind of often misunderstood group of people, hunter-gatherer groups living around the world today, um, indigenous groups, uh, people who've been practicing hunter-gathering for, hunting and gathering for a very long time, some people who've been adapting and adopting aspects of a hunter gathering lifestyle um, within the kind of relatively recent past. Um, a really, really interesting group of people um, and there's all sorts of ideas kicking around within our society today that relate to hunter-gatherers and when you start to unpick where these ideas come from, they're quite interesting. They've got a kind of interesting sort of backstory. But at kind of the general level, um, one of the areas that hunter-gatherers are being really, really highly valued today in our society is the concept of wild foods. So the idea of um, foods that are sourced without the use of agriculture as being healthier, as being higher quality, you know, go over to Ireland and, you know, the, co the, the companies, the restaurants that do wild foods are also the restaurants that charge a lot of money for, you know, <laughs> wild salmon and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a kind of a really, there are some really interesting attitudes towards um, hunter-gatherers that are being manifest through the, through the food industry. Um, but also things like the bushcraft movement, uh, people wanting to spend time, more time outdoors, people wanting to learn the skills that are required to be self-sufficient and to survive outdoors, um, to not necessarily be dependent on uh, agriculture and kind of the animals or, 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 or stuff that's been, been bought from shops, but uh, resources that people could collect themselves and hunt themselves. Uh, these are ideas that are, that are really appealing to people at the moment, um, and you can see the popularity of folk like Ray Mears um, kind of capturing that um, and, and sort of putting that forward. Um, and also this kind of 
broader movement, hunter gatherers also appearing in the kind of in the in the nature writing set in the kind of the, the movement in literary um, circles in, in recent years to uh, kind of embrace the pastoral, the wild, the wilderness, and to write about that in kind of evocative ways. Um, and it's really interesting to think about. Often that process gets gets discussed in terms of rewilding the self. So so. Um, to shedding the, the trappings of agriculture or urbanism or cosmopolitanism uh, and, and, and returning to or taking up aspects of hunter-gatherer lifestyles which overlap with very tasty food, with um, spending time outdoors, with, with bushcraft, with aspects of Ramiers, um, but are written about in a very evocative way. So it's kind of, that's a, there's a movement within literature that is also tapping in um, tangentially to the concept of a hunter-gatherer and a hunter-gatherer are shared Hunter gatherer pass as a species. So, in terms of telling sort of a heritage narrative and sort of building a hunt, the, the concept of a hunter gatherer heritage into the story of Stronsi, that's something that other regions of Orkney will really struggle to do because the archaeology of, of, of hunter gatherers in those other areas of Orkney isn't perhaps as clear cut or as captivating or as exciting as what we have at Link's House. Um, but there is a really clear story emerging from this site that I think um, is worth thinking about um, and worth considering the different ways in which it might be told. I'll sum up. Yeah, so, thanks Ben. So yeah, I mean, just, to, just to sum up some of the things we said and you know, hopefully that's kind of helped put the story of this site into a bit of context, thinking about it on the wider sort of European scale, thinking about it in its Or- Orcadian context and then in its island context. And even though the island has quite clearly changed over all this period of time. But the really key things to bring from the, the, the evidence that we found at the site is that these are, these are temporary camps. These are, we'll be talking about them being mobile people moving around the landscape. One of the key things we found was that it's a woodland site. So it's very different way, very different landscape, very different environment, different sounds, smells, everything to we might experience today. Um, so we found evidence for multiple structures and these were replaced and maintained on the same footprint for a period of around you know, 200 years um, according to the dates. We think, as Ben was saying, the stone tools probably represent a small fragment of what they're excavating but in comparison to other Mesolithic sites it has a high proportion of lithics so you know, it, it is looking like a specialist tool making site within this woodland context. Um, you know, on a bright, broad, broader context, it does show how the Mesolithic um, features do survive in Orkney. And maybe there's more in Stronzi. Maybe there's lots of Mesolithic sites in Stronzi, and we've just found one of them. Um, and it is the first structural evidence this far north, and it's the first dated and the oldest settlement in the far north of Scotland. So it is really, really important on these different, different scales. And that's us. Thank you very much.